Hey guys and welcome back to a new video. In this video I want to clarify one of the biggest misunderstandings Android and Kotlin developers have regarding coroutine dispatchers. Because it's incredible how often I see people misuse coroutine dispatchers in their code, which tells me that most people don't really understand the idea and the purpose of what these dispatchers are actually used for and why different dispatchers are actually better for certain different use cases. So to maybe first of all show uh, two bad examples, I've prepared a dummy repository that simply makes an API call here to a dummy API, it fetches some products, and what I see very often is that people wrap this inside of a with context dispatches IO block because, well, you are executing an IO call here. Same thing counts for making a DB query where you, where you maybe access your room DAO and uh, you would then use this to access your search query in here while putting this inside of a with context dispatches IO block. Or another bad example is having some kind of data store preferences here, for example, where you want to expose the data as a persistent uh, state flow, where you just listen to the uh, data flow that comes from data store, you maybe map it to something um, like your domain level object, your domain level preferences object, and then you flow this on the IO dispatcher, so all the steps before will also be executed on the IO dispatcher because in the end you are reading preferences here, right? But let me tell you, doing it like this won't cause any bugs or so, but it's simply completely pointless. It does not change anything. It does not make this code more efficient. This here does not make this network call more efficient in any way. It's simply redundant code you don't need here. In order to understand this, let's actually first understand the differences between those different coroutine dispatchers that we have. So just as a little recap, we have threads on the one hand and we have coroutines. A single thread is in the end just a single execution flow in your program where you can call blocking code, so just um, function calls that may take a little while to complete without blocking code from other threads. However, one single thread can host a lot of individual child coroutines. So coroutines are always running inside of a single thread. And multiple coroutines inside of the single thread can still run independently. So we can have a single thread make two asynchronous network calls on that single thread while using two asynchronous coroutines and this code will be called asynchronously, so in parallel, even though we just have one thread. So much about the theory. So every coroutine that we run a suspend function in must run on some kind of thread and we can still have multi-threading, so multiple threads where each thread hosts multiple coroutines. And in the end, what we specify with coroutine dispatchers here is just the size of the thread pool, at least if we talk about the IO versus the default coroutine dispatcher. Putting the main dispatcher aside, if we just take a look at the IO and default dispatcher, then the role and the job of a dispatcher is in the end just to decide which specific thread a launched coroutine will run on. And the type of dispatcher that we choose, IO versus default, or here we can even include main, really just is responsible for having different configurations, different rules that decide about which thread a coroutine is executed in. So the easiest one to understand here is just the main dispatcher, since the main dispatcher can run coroutines only on a single thread, and that is our application's main thread. Dispatcher IO and dispatcher's default are a bit different. Because the whole differences between the I.O. and the default dispatcher is that the I.O. dispatcher has a larger thread pool, so a larger pool of possible threads where it can run coroutines in. Specifically, with the I.O. dispatcher, the thread pool has a size of at least 64, so there are 64 potential threads where a specific piece of code can be executed in if you run it on the I.O. dispatcher. While the default dispatcher does not have that large of a thread pool, but it only has that many threads as the phone has CPU cores. So if your phone has four CPU cores, then running a piece of code on the default dispatcher can choose between four different distinct threads this piece of code can run on. So why would this actually make a performance difference in our code and why is this still redundant and doesn't do anything? And in which cases do we actually need to switch to the IO or default dispatcher? Well, in order to first of all understand why the IO dispatcher is better for IO related operations and why the default one is better for CPU heavy operations, this is really because of the nature of IO and CPU heavy operations. If we think of a blocking network call, so we make a network call to a remote API and doing so obviously takes some amount of time because we need to fire off the request and then we have some, some sort of idle period in which we did not yet get the response in which we are then waiting for the response. But in this idle period, our app isn't really doing anything because it's completely out of our influence when the server will respond. So there is no way for us to actually speed up getting that server response 
by just having CPU power. We can have the best CPU in the world if the server just takes some time to process, well, then we won't get the reply faster. And for these types of calls that are blocking on the one hand, but where our app can still use this idle time where we are waiting for a network response for different tasks that require the CPU more, there it, we, of course, benefit a whole lot more from having a lot of parallel threads that we run, which is why the thread pool for the IO dispatcher is just a lot larger than for the default one. Since if we have, let's say, 64 different threads, then we can fire up 64 different distinct network calls at the same time. This does not require our CPU in, in any meaningful way because we just fire off the request, which is not very expensive, but then we just wait in all those distinct parallel threads at the same time for the same response, and each thread gets its own response after, let's say, a second. So we can just run a lot of different network calls at the same time, or if we think of uh, reading or writing to a file, then there's also this certain overhead where a certain file needs to be opened, the OS needs to provide the information. So there's just a certain delay that we can speed up with CPU power. So again, here we would benefit from multiple distinct parallel threads. And that is why the IO dispatcher is better for these tasks. If we now take a look at the default one, again, reminder, the default dispatcher runs just as many threads as we have CPU cores. And let's now imagine we want to maximize performance in our app. We want to, we have a certain task that we can now speed up with CPU power. So for example, just imagine you have a list of 1 million entries and you just loop over this list and map all those entries to some kind of other class. Then that requires a lot of CPU power. There are simply zero idle periods of a single thread in that time because the thread is constantly doing something. It's constantly mapping items. It's constantly looping over these. So for such an example, we don't get any advantage by having more threads than we have CPU cores, because at most, every single CPU core can be busy at its maximum. Since with multi-threading in and of itself, that just means that we switch between multiple tasks in a smart way while, while, one, uh, while one task is actually in an idle period, like a network call, so we have time to go or to, to spend CPU power for different tasks. That is what multi-threading is about. But we can suddenly run, let's say, eight parts or eight pieces of code in, in true parallel so that they are all executed at the exact same time if we just have four CPU cores, because of course, every CPU core can really do only one thing at a given instant. So that is why the IO dispatcher is better for network calls, for file reading, for file writing, and so on, while the default dispatcher is better for CPU heavy tasks. But that did still not answer the question why this is redundant, because we do have a network call here, and here we definitely do read from preferences. Well, and the reason why this is a misuse and misunderstanding of coroutine dispatches is because people don't understand the principle of main safety. Uh, we have that in coroutines. The principle of main safety pretty much just says that any suspend function in your code, so the function that suspends a coroutine, should be safe to call from the main thread. And as you probably know, we don't want to accidentally block the main thread with a suspend function, with a network call, something like that, which is why the responsibility to switch to the right dispatcher lies at the function that converts a blocking call, so a call that blocks a thread, like really reading from an input stream or so. So the function that takes this input stream converts that, that reading process from an input stream to a suspending function. So to a, a function that suspends a single coroutine while reading that uh, input stream, that function has the responsibility to switch to the right dispatcher. So here in our dummy repository, this get function is already a suspend function. So this is a function that comes from Ktor, and somewhere deep down in Ktor, in the Ktor library or in Retrofit, whatever you're using, there must be a function that really just sends the raw bytes over the network that is not suspending. And therefore, the Ktor library has a certain function, specifically this get function, which is suspending and which has to take this blocking call for sending over these raw bytes and convert this to a suspending call. And this function has the responsibility to switch to the IO dispatcher because then this get function is safe to be called from the main thread because no matter what kind of dispatcher we call this on, internally, it will always switch to the right one. So we can't be off with that. So let's take a look at a good example. Here, under good examples, file storage, really just a simple example that takes the context and then um, writes certain content to a certain file that is a suspend function. This save function should really uh, suspend a single coroutine and we should be able to call multiple save functions in parallel with multiple coroutines. And here it makes sense to switch to the IO dispatcher. Because if we take a look at what this function does, it really opens a file output. It opens the output stream and simply writes some bytes to it. But if we take a look at the content of this with context block, there are no suspending calls. All those calls and writing to a file is certainly blocking. It takes a little moment to complete. It's nothing that um, finishes after a millisecond or so. 
But if we just have it like that without this with context block, you can see the suspend uh, keyword here becomes redundant because this function, if we call it, will block the entire thread it's executed in. And if you have one thread, which currently hosts 10 independent child coroutines, and you call such a blocking call that is not a suspending call in one of these child coroutines, it will block the entire thread and it will therefore block all the other coroutines running in it. While if we now put this in a with context IO block, the IO dispatcher can now take care of actually launching this on a separate background thread on up to 64 even more threads. So we can have a lot of asynchronous independent calls of this safe function without blocking a single thread that we would otherwise accidentally call this in. For example, if you call this in a, in a view model scope coroutine, you would block the main thread with that. That can't happen if you actually surround this with, with context dispatches IO, because even if you call the suspend function itself on, on the view model scope coroutine running on the main dispatcher by default, the moment you enter this, it makes sure to always switch to the right dispatcher here by default, by design, so you can't make any accidental mistakes there. So same thing here for our dummy preferences. You can be sure that the procedure where data store really reads from the raw file that it saves on your, on your disk, that this already happens on the right dispatcher here. So this IO dispatcher would really just apply to this map function here. And this map function does not do anything in regards to IO functionality. So it doesn't save something to a file, it doesn't make a network call, it really just maps um, the result to a user. So you can just leave this here, and if this would be a very complex mapping function, so again, you're mapping a, a big, a big uh, piece of data to another big piece of data, then it could make sense, okay, to actually execute this on the default dispatcher, because it's CPU-heavy work to map something. Not generally, but if you map large data, then technically yes. So this would be much more appropriate in this case, because it applies to this, but not to the internal call that data store uses to read from a file. And to also show you one last example here from my uh, current uh, Echo Journal course, the new course I'm working on, which is uh, from a coding challenge in my uh, mobile dev campus. Campus members, by the way, will get this course for free very soon in May. But here I have a very complex flow chain. So we load some echoes. So an echo is just a voice audio memo with all its metadata. We load that from our local data source. We observe that, so we get the flow. We filter them by mood and topics. On each, we do something, we update our state, we combine them with something else. And then I say flow on default dispatcher. Because what this will do is it will execute the entire chain before on the default dispatcher, not on the main thread. So all these calls, all this mapping, looping, filtering does not happen on the main thread. So it can't possibly block our UI. Things like this, uh, things like state updates like this are a very common source of actually causing some jank frames in your UI because by default, all these state updates in your view model, if you launch them here on view model scope, will run on the main thread, will run on the main dispatcher. And since the UI and updating the UI also happens on the main thread, slowing down that thread will obviously lead to less UI updates and less UI, update, uh, less UI updates imply that you have less frames available, less frames mean lag. So I hope you really got the idea. Switching the dispatcher does only make sense if the code that is inside of the with context block is actually blocking and not suspending code. It's not a problem if certain parts of your with context block are suspending and certain others aren't that are blocking. But if the only call inside of the with context block is a suspending function, then you're doing it wrong. The only exception here is if you're using XML and you need to maybe perform a certain UI update on the main thread because you can only update the UI on the main thread there, um, but this does not apply to Jetpack Compose. In all other cases, take this as a hint. Do you have a with context block with just a single suspending function there or with multiple suspending functions? Or just one that only consists of uh, suspending functions and possibly other code that is not blocking, then you're doing it wrong. If you have real blocking code in there, code that takes a while to complete, that is not suspending, then you're doing it right to put this in a with context block. Hope this clarified some things for you. Let me know down below if it did. If you're excited for this course here to build an audio journaling app, here are also the mockups that you, by the way, get in the mobile campus on a bi-monthly basis for a full app. Um, this is the app that we will build in this course. Stay tuned. Um, if you become a member of the campus right now, then you will definitely get free access to this course. But I also announced this here on YouTube, of course, when this course comes out. So you can see a very heavy, a very big app. Uh, we will put a lot of focus on uh, learning the right architecture for this native app as well. Link is down below. Thanks so much for watching. I will see you back in the next video. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye-bye. <laughs>